This conference will now be recorded. Thank you, Zubaida. You're here. Welcome. Please let us know in the chat box, introduce yourselves and who you're affiliated with. That will be lovely. Aha, if you like, please. Aha, if you like, please. Okay, Allison, I'll turn it over to you. And VJ, if you don't mind putting up your screen, that would be lovely. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I'll give just a quick introduction and then we can go ahead and get started. Um, today we have with us VJ Desmana. Um, he's an ecological gardener who specializes in rewilding projects that bring back natural flora and fauna into landscapes that have become severely de degraded. He has cur curated, excuse me, a 380 acre wasteland into the Ara Valley Biodiversity Park in Gurgaon. And over the last 10 years with I Am Gurgaon, he has restored this ruined quartzite mining site into an Ara Valley forest and has a remarkable nursery of native plants. I Am Gurgaon is also a member of the Delhi Urban Network a collection of seven conservation-based organizations in Delhi, working to connect on urban forestry issues in the national capital region. Um, and just a few quick reminders before we get started. Um, as Liza mentioned, we are recording the session and we'll make it available to you all. Um, we'll ask that you mute yourselves throughout the presentation, um, but we'll welcome you to turn them back on or turn your microphones on and your cameras as well for the question and answer session. Um, and the chat box will be open throughout and we'll be monitoring it closely. So feel free to ask any questions that you have. With that, BJ, I'll turn it over to you. So can I start? Should I start? Yes, yes mm -hmm. please. Okay, can you see my screen, please, Alison? Can you help me with that? Um, we can see your screen, but um, it's not on the PowerPoint presentation. Oh, so, okay. Now? Okay. So, um, yes. thank you for giving me this opportunity to share our experiences in the Aravalis. And uh, I will talk about two projects in the Aravalis. One which is very close to the national capital region of Delhi. And another is um, about 250 kilometers south, a place called Jaipur. So both are in the Aravalis, but very different landscapes. So I think I, uh, it would be nice to give you a glimpse into how diverse the Aravalis are. Yeah. So I, this is uh, what, what I, I'm going to talk about is basically what are Aravlis, yeah? So this is map of India of uh, Northwestern region. And if you look on the extreme left is Pakistan. On the Northeast is Tibet, China. You can see Nepal also. But if you look at Delhi, and this whole region, this is Aravlis. Aravlis are the oldest full mountains in the world, um, dated close to 3 billion years old. Um, and uh, all the landscape that you see here is a very recent desertification that has happened over the last 20,000 years. So these are the districts that have Aravlis in them. Aravlis being so old are very degraded, weathered, and of course they have shaped the whole region. So if you look at the satellite maps, this is how <coughs> Aravlis look on the left. This is a place called Sariska Tiger Reserve, where we have close to 
20 odd tigers. Uh, there were many more once upon a time, but due to poaching and habitat loss, we lost many of those tigers. And there was a point when we lost all the tigers. And then there was a reintroduction program and there is a revival of tiger uh, population in this place. On the right is the quartzite rocks. It's called quartzite reef, which you often get because it's a hard rock. And uh, that's mainly what you get in the northern Arabi. This is a landscape of Arabi, as you can see. These are not very tall mountains. They are on, in the in the northern belt. They are about you know 600 to 800 meters tall. But if you go to South Aravlis, they can go up to 1,800 meters. Now, Aravli holds close to six national parks and 11 sanctuaries. It is biodiversity-wise quite rich, wildlife-wise quite rich, and becomes a corridor you know, for the movement of animals, except for a few patches where uh, there is urbanization uh, mostly urbanization and village uh, boundaries, which kind of restrict movement of animals. These are some of the pictures of the Aravlis. This is very close to Delhi. And you look at the forest behind, it's called Anagysis pendula forest, which is from Combritaceae family. And when you go to the foothills, the landscape changes. You get alluvium deposit, you get water, and you get wetlands, you get rivers. You know, there are rivers which are coming out of Arablis. And there is a lot of bird population, migrating population, which comes to these places. This is the Sariska Tiger Reserve that I was talking about. And you can see on the extreme right where my cursor is, this patch is the, is the oldest patch. This is the banded Nisic complex of which the Indian uh, plate is made, the uh, craton. The central part is the sandstone, which is perhaps 2 billion years old. And on top sits the quartzite, which is dated between 1 to 750 million years old. Now the forest, if you look, the forest on the top is very different from the forest in this ledge is very different from the forest that you find in the valleys. Now, this is a sacred grove very close to uh, Delhi, I was talking about. And again, the forest is poor. There are many, many such <coughs> sacred forests. There are close to 25,000 sacred forests only in Rajasthan and close to 11,000 in the Ravlis. So you have a temple or a mazar or a, you know, dedicated to one deity and a large area is protected by them. Now, as you saw, this is how it looks in a monsoon. And this is what it looks in a dry season. So the same tree, Anogysis pendula, is bare. Yeah, by the end of October, November, it drops all its leaves. It turns copperish and goes bare. And you can see the valleys are still rich green. And you can see there is a seasonal stream which flows through this watershed. Now, in the valleys, you get a very different kind of forest. Here, this is a Butea monosperma from a Fabaceae family forest. Along with it, you get uh, you know, uh, many other species, Mithrigynas, to Phoenix, to Polyptilias, to, I mean, I can Tell the names may if somebody is interested i can share what they are but on the top if you look that's the anogysis pendula forest mind you we get a very very our rainfall is restricted to monsoon which is about two months in a year and it's very it's very low we have we get about uh, 500 to 600 mm rain and often not as a drizzle, but as a, as a burst. And there is nothing which holds water in these hills, and most of it is run, uh, run off. 
But what happens, quadzites are, are made up of a lot of fissures. So whatever the root zone kind of filters in, a lot of water do get uh, saved in these in these aravlis. So the the potential, the recharging potential of the aravli is close to 20 lakh liters per hectare. If you understand hectare, which is about 10,000 square meter, that's the uh, that's the that's the volume of water. 20 lakh liters. Lakh is um, 100,000. Now, what you see, this is Aravli, but what you see is piling above sand. So if you refer to the map before, what you saw was the alluvium and the sand and the desert uh, expanding. And here, Aravli has become a barrier. And there is huge piling up of sand on the southern western side. And now the flora changes completely because the, it, the, the plants that grow in the sand is very different. It's mostly from the, from the Thar landscape and uh, xerophytic mostly. This is what you get on the sandy dunes that are formed, that are not moving, are stationary, mostly ephemerals, largely shrubs. So, and these shrublands are called roi in the in the traditional uh, terminology and uh, you get diverse uh, wildlife here from caracal to jungle cats to foxes of two kinds to uh, deers of two kinds to antelopes to you know many many kinds of reptiles and this also becomes a route for migration of birds so therefore a rich diversity of birds in the Aravli, it is estimated there are close to, reporting close to um, uh, 700 species of birds. And in terms of mammal species, we have, uh, in the Aravlis, we have tigers, we have leopards, we have caracal, we have sloth bear, uh, deer, large deers such as um, sambar, to large antelopes such as nilgai, to many, many other species of uh, uh, langurs, monkeys, rhesus macaques, um, smaller animals, lots of smaller animals. It's quite rich. Now, what you also see in the semi-arid region are clonal forests, and there are many trees. In order to, uh, you know, propagate, they 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 propagate by becoming clonal forests. So this is Salvadora oleodes, and you can see it is forming a cluster of its own. It's a nice evergreen from the uh, from our arid and semi-arid regions. You get large grasslands also. You know this is a, uh, this was a this this was a hunting ground earlier. Now it's a sanctuary called uh, a Tal Chapar Sanctuary, and you can see black bucks there. Now wetlands are again wetlands. There are many, many wetlands in this uh, whole landscape, and which lend itself to the uh, to the richness of the biodiversity. Now what I'm going to talk about is these. What happened to these aravlis? Yes. This is what has happened to the aravlis. So this is <coughs> this was a wetland, and you can see the traces of water getting uh, being seen in the pockets and urbanization has taken over this is in delhi delhi gurgaon border gurgaon this the um, the region i work with i am gurgaon now aravlis are very very rich in terms of minerals as well and there is huge exploitation of aravlis so this is a, a hill which I have been noticing for last eight years being slowly, slowly eaten up. Um, and uh, most of these hills are eaten up illegally. There was a Supreme Court case in which uh, in the northern Aravlis there are 131 hills and 29 of them had disappeared. So the Supreme Court asked the government, where did they disappear? Do you have any answer to that? So 
what has happened because minerals are important because rock is important for building for you know putting up a city or urbanization uh, we have lost lots of forest land to mining in the Aravlis. Now, what has happened is uh, urbanization, as I mentioned, is also going to the edges of the hills and putting a lot of pressure on the wild lands and threatening the biodiversity. You can see in the cities or in rural areas, that's what is happening. Whether it's a wetland or whether it is hill, there is encroachment all over. Now, this is my first project that I'm going to talk about is in the city of Gurugram or Gurgaon. Gurgaon was its previous name. Now it's called Gurugram. It's uh, south of Delhi in the state called Haryana. Now, Haryana is a, Haryana is a predominantly agricultural state. And uh, in the succession, if you see human succession, agriculture lands get converted into commercial lands. And that's what has happened to Gurgaon. <clears throat> Gurgaon, which was mostly an agricultural land, is now a commercial hub. It's a commercial hub of, of the northern India. And many, many of these uh, big uh, multinationals are, are, have their bases in this place. Now, all this comes at a huge cost. Gurgaon, the most polluted city in the world. This is a, this is a <coughs> Greenpeace report. And you can see they, in 2019, they termed Gurugram as the most polluted city. Now, what a paradox, you know, you are the richest city in Haryana. You are, richest, are, you are emerging as the richest city in the Northern India and you are the most polluted. Another indicator, Gurugram's, Gurugram's water, groundwater table has fallen by 82% in the last decade. So there is extraction and there is so much extraction there is going to be water crisis and a severe water crisis now if you look at the map of haryana this is the state of uh, haryana where gurugram is there are hardly any forests left so what where we are this is gurugram and this sliver of green is the aravlis that you see and a little bit of wilderness that is left in the southern haryana is found here what you find in the north is of the Himalayan foothills, and that that little bit is protected. Otherwise, so in the state we have the forest is less than one percent. Imagine a state has less than one percent forest. So this is funny. If you if you type forest in Haryana, you will often get two forests, but if you type forest in Gurugram, you get nothing. So the project, first project is in Gurugram and is about creating a forest. And this is a I am Gurugram project, an NGO which is dedicated to uplift the city. Uh, it was a volunteers group which came together and said that we want to do something for the city, not to fight, but to work along with the government that was the intent of i am Gurgaon. so this project was uh, this piece of land which is close to uh, 380 acres of mined land and what was mined here was a quadzitic rock that was mined for building and the sand you get which is uh, the quadzite sand which is very very rich very very useful in construction that's what was mined in this 380 acres so what you do is you extract the rocks and then you crush it and then you make smaller pebbles or smaller size rocks and then you sell it into the market so we have eight such stone crushers on the land which are there was a supreme court ban on stone crushing on borewell digging and on mining in 2004 which led to closing of this mining site <clears throat> and stone crushing and then in 2009, I am Gurga, uh, somebody called Atal Kapoor spotted this land and he said, let's make this into a city park. And the idea was to create a city park in this 380 acres. Now, this is the landscape of the park. If you look in 2010, when I am Gurga spotted it and kind of made a proposal to the, to the, 
to the municipal body, this is what it was. And here you can see the slabs of quartzite, you know, telling the story of sandstone and metamorphic uh, nature of these rocks. But these are the mining pits, and you can see in terms of even after 2004 to 2010, what you see is a little bit of sacrum, sacrum which is um, which is a quite an invasive sacrum bengalens, which is quite an invasive species in. Florida, I hear, in large part of Australia it is. And you see Prosopis juliflora. Of course, it is native to the Central Americas, but it's a big pest in our area. And that's what we had. In the whole of the landscape, what you found was a little bit of grasses and largely Prosopis juliflora. Here again, this is in the month of September, after the rains, this is what the landscape had to show. Largely, all these bushes, all the bushes are Prosopis juliflora, except for this one, which is again a North African tree, Acacia totalis, brought in by the by the forest department to plant these kind of areas. Now, I and Brigon came up with an idea that they wanted to plant a million trees uh, in one day. And I think it was mainly Lethika who was spearheading it. And she said she was quite determined that we should plant a million trees in a day. And this is in 2010 and uh, create a buzz so that people get, you know, uh, people understand why we need to plant, why we need to, you know, conserve nature. So the idea was that, but uh, somehow it, it didn't become so easily. Uh, it was not easy to do that, and in and then I was um, I became part of the project, and we all started questioning what we need to do. Do we need a city park? Do we need a what do we need out of this place? And then we went to this into this journey that such a huge mining land should tell a story, should tell a story of hope, of revival, of what a city can do other than creating skyscrapers and pollution and depletion of groundwater what can a city in its right mind in its its in it in its uh, you know uh, capacity can do and that was the change we you know you can you can see from the title we are reviving a forest and that was the idea that from moving from million number to coming to planting a forest and that's the central message that uh, we all now hold on to and we communicate wherever we go that it's not about numbers. It is about creating habitats. It's about creating ecologies. So this was in 2011 when we came together and we said, okay, let's, let's um, create a forest. Now we had traveled extensively, me and the whole team. We, some forest we went together but largely uh, me and my team, we went to uh, study the whole of Aravlis, understand the flora, understand the micro habitats within the Aravlis. And we drew a vision of the park. And the vision of the park was that we created this as a city forest, showcasing the flora of Northern Aravlis, make it into a recreational space. You know, unfortunately, none of the forests, none of the wilderness is safe unless it interacts creatively with the humans. Otherwise, it's, it's always something to extract, always something to take something from. If humans are interacting with wildlife, if humans are interacting with the wilderness in a creative way, then those places are conserved, preserved, and, and, and become symbol of heritage. So that's, that was the idea behind recreational space. Then groundwater recharge, as I, as we, as I have mentioned before, Burgaon is facing huge water crisis, and this place um, was recharging closely, close to 3.2 billion liters of water every year. So we started with uh, making meticulous notes on what species to bring in, what are the kinds of forests we have in the Aravlis, the Aravli landscape. Uh, generally um, speaking has broadly speaking has eight kinds of forests there are on the outcrops you will find boswellia serrata forests you will find anogysis pendula forest 
in the more degraded form you'll find the uh, acacia senegal forest you will also find in the valleys butia monospoma forest you will find acacia kateku forest you will find uh, grass, grasslands um, of uh, sacrum and phoenix and so on and so forth yeah so the, those those were the plants that we had to grow unlike other parts of the world i'm not so sure but uh, in india forest department which is a custodian of forests and revival of forests they in their nursery if you go you will find that of the 20 25 species that they grow maybe one or two species native to that region you will find otherwise most of it will be exotic or not from that region because their criteria is that they have to grow plants which are not eaten by animals which are fast growing and often toxic so <clears throat> so uh, that's so it's an unfortunate story uh, because it's a it's a catch-22 situation where we you know you want to plant but you you don't know what to plant because there are you know there is wildlife there are human intervention and so on and so forth so here when we came up with a list of 200 plants we had to go into the jungles collect those seeds uh, grow them in our own nursery and then plant them out so in the first year we got some 35 species seeds of 35 species then we got 50 species then we have got let me tell you we have we were working on a shoestring budget you know there is no big funding that's coming on it's just our individual you know our small um, the finance model that I'm going on was opting or per plant basis that we were trying to take away all the money and getting all these uh, logistics uh, done we made meticulous notes of the travels where what should be grown what densities what species and all of that and we started planting it up now i think this is a very easy all this is very easy but what is great about this whole intervention is the, the ingenuity that i brought in which is it invited whole city to come and participate in the wilding in the wilding process which is we used to mark where we are planting what all species we used to dig our pits we used to place our plants species wise depending what kind of uh, forest we wanted and then we would invite the citizen the children the corporates to come and plant in these landscapes so here you can see uh, children from government school they are coming and planting it also gave an opportunity for us to educate children on the native plants and why to plant native species, what are the forests of Aravnis, what is the biodiversity that you get, all of that. You know? So it, was, it, it used to be celebration for us. Of course, it was very taxing, very exhausting because of the logistics involved, because you had to plan and, and monsoons, are, monsoons are also very, very, very you know, humid for us. And it, it may not rain every day, but it is humid and sweaty. This is uh, my colleague giving a demonstration to the corporates as to how to plant, because it was very important. This was a time when you could get their attention. You can see how hooked they are when you're talking about the plants, when you're talking about how to plant, why it has to be plant, planted that way, and what will become of this. So these are now uh, some of the examples of how the land transformed. You saw my first picture that was uh, taken this year and you can see the landscape now this is in 2010 and most of the most of the uh, vegetation here uh, shrub vegetation that you're seeing is prosipus juliflora a very invasive plant in our landscape this is once you have removed the prosipus juliflora we we ideated and we came up with the idea that we should create an acacia nilotica uh, subspecies indica plant, uh, forest here which is what you will find typically in the aravlis and on the higher reaches you want to put uh, mitragyna parvifolia forest but on the ridge you wanted dho forest so similarly this is uh, in 2010 there's a water body and if you look at the larger landscape all all prosopis juliflora now the this is 
this is what it has become in 2017 when we removed the Prosopis juliflora and grasses came up. We propagated these grasses so that, uh, you know, the soil is forming. And uh, as a result, now, this is what has happened now. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite wooded with diverse forest around there. <clears throat> Another example, this is a bare hill. Uh, you can see quartzitic rock exposing and a few shrubs of Prosopis juliflora. And this is what, uh, this is a picture from last year. And you can see a scrub forest has come up, very young, but still robust. And there is a recruitment of species happening, which is very nice. This is another, this is a mining pit, as you can see. And again, it has been colonized by Prosopis juliflora. Now this is what has become of that mining pit. Again, this is a two-year-old picture. Hopefully this year we'll get a better vegetation. Um, once you create the habitat, uh, the, the faunal species, the avifauna, birds and animals, they take over. They happily come over and enjoy the landscape. So we have this largest antelope in the India uh, on the right hand side called the Nilgai. And we have close to 199 species of birds reported in the park, which is quite good for the added landscape, which has no water body in it. We have lots of reptiles. We have snakes. The top five venomous snakes are reported in the park. We have eight amphibians recorded again, which is a rare thing because amphibians um, this is our semi-arid landscape is not known for its amphibians. Then we have uh, lots of uh, insect diversity, which is very nice. Uh, we have got close to 50 plus species of butterfly without a proper study, just by voluntary effort, people have uh, reported those many butterflies. This is a jackal carrying a hare. So somebody called Misha Bansal, a student from Jawaharlal Nehru University, did her master's thesis on the park. She kind of studied the restoration site, which is the Aravli Biodiversity Park, compared it with the Prosopis juliflora forest right next to the park and looked at the species uh, diversity and populations. And this is what she came up with, clearly suggesting that the restoration efforts yield good results. So there, in the 200 species, we have got lots of nice, rare plants that Haryana has lost. Um, and I'm very glad to share that many of them are flowering and fruiting and new recruitment of young ones are happening. Now, as a result, this place has become an educational space for universities, for college students, for school students, and Many, many a times you'll find uh, people coming here and studying. We encourage it. It is really endearing that people from far off, even from Andhra Pradesh Forest Department comes and looks at the restoration site. It has become a burning hotspot. Uh, as I reported, 199 species are reported from the park, which is quite good. Some of the rarities in the Delhi NCR region were reported in the last three years. Um, might not be rare in other places, but, uh, but uh, for example, um, Rufus Tail Scrub Robin reported after 20 years was reported from the park. Then what we do is we also give lots of opportunities for people to volunteer. This, these are people working in the nursery, uh, filling the poly bags. We also do lots of nature walks for people to understand the different forests that we have created, the wildlife, and this is how the forest has emerged. Uh, quite, um, quite satisfying, actually. These are some recruitments that you can see. Uh, this is Boswellia serrata, often found on the, the topmost um, ridges of the Aravli landscape. And here, these are the seedlings of that species. Um, there is a lot of nesting happening in the park. Of various kinds of birds from golden orioles to drongos to yellow-footed green pigeons to many many others 
and we are working on interpretation of the flora fauna uh, of the park and hope uh, this integrates well with it. So this is how the landscape has transformed. It is now a um, very young forest and hopefully it will mature. Uh, these are the different kinds of forests that exist here. This is a baboon forest, Acacia nilotica, subspecies indica forest. Uh, you have the saccharum uh, forest. Uh, typically, you'll find sac um, grassland saccharum with phoenix, and we have added phoenix to it. Hopefully, phoenix will show in a few years to come. So that's our hope that within a city uh, which is known for uh, its businesses, it should be known for its wildlife and its uh, human agency, which brought back a forest. Now, I'll take you to another project. This is uh, this is uh, about 250 kilometers from the the Gurgaon project in Rajasthan state, and it is done by uh, another authority, which is called Jaipur Development Authority. And I'll give you a quick glimpse into it because here you see the Aravali Hills on the back, but what you see is the piled up old sand. And uh, these old fossil dunes are, are quite in bad state because uh, of human, um, human exploitation and uh, lots of grazing happening here. <clears throat> this, is, this project was uh, offered or um, somebody called Pradeep Krishan, quite a known person in Delhi landscape in terms of eco restoration, a dear friend of mine. He got this project and he teamed up with a few of us, uh, three, four of us. And uh, while me and him looked into the ecology, there were architect, um, Golak and landscape architect who looked into the creation of structures within the within this landscape. This is close to 120 acres in phase first, first phase <clears throat> and this was the terrain you can see the sand completely disturbed ready to blow off to <clears throat> lots of these camel uh, cattle uh, track park uh, paths and very disturbed landscape you know. so if, if you look at an aerial view this is what is happening there's weathering of this piling up of sand has happened and you can see where there is less disturbance, the whole landscape is very different. Now, the land sits in the city of Jaipur. So you can see the whole Aravlis on the, on the right. These are the Aravlis. This is the sand which has piled up and this is the city of Jaipur. <clears throat> and it is quite recent that in 2016 that we proposed this to the JDA. Uh, to create a sustainable public park. And we created a master plan that what will be the master plan <clears throat> of this landscape. What we thought of was to create a, a one, uh, one whole experience area where people could walk on a boardwalk and experience different islands of interpretation, yeah? and then walk into the wilderness. <clears throat> that was the idea. Now, what in before we started on the on the on those islands and uh, experience creation, we had to create the that landscape first. So what we did is we collected lots of seeds from the wilderness of such sand dunes, and uh, we also collected lots of uh, soil rich with uh, with the seeds of these species. We bought them, we collected them in these from these landscapes in huge piles of different species. It was a huge endeavor. And then we spread them into the landscape. This resulted into germination of many of these species. This is Tephrosia falciformis, one of the pioneers in, the, in our desert landscape and very happily germinating. Again, that Tephrosia falciformis. Yeah. When there are sinews, there are air rivers, there are crotal areas that grew in these landscapes. <clears throat> and we marked all the shrubs that we had planted, all the grass clumps that we had planted, physically planted from growing in them in our nursery to planting them out. Yeah. So the idea was to create a shrubland and not a woodland. 
and that's what uh, we were achieving where the density of trees would be less than 20 percent and you could see within once one one year of uh, work you could see the grasses thriving you know this you can see at least four species of grasses here <clears throat> from uh, Sancra ciliaris to Aristidas to, uh, to Sacrum. Then we created these uh, small interpretation islands. This is, uh, this is the same sand dune which you saw uh, uh, you know, at the start of the presentation uh, where this body has been created. These are, all the land is now covered with, with uh, ephemerals and uh, grasses and uh, Forbes. This is what you get. You can see patches of uh, uh, different um, combinations of uh, grasses and herbs. <clears throat> then we created uh, small islands for uh, different kinds of soils that you get in the in the whole uh, larger landscape of Rajasthan, and we created these islands. Uh, you can see all dedicated to different habitats that you find, and uh, this is what has happened. Now you can showcase, tell people what grows where and how. We have interpreted the whole area. We have put close to 110 signs, uh, information signs on species, on habitats in these areas. <clears throat> uh, we also created a rocky patch, which, which uh, gives us opportunity to showcase flora of the rocky Aravlis. Here you can see the ferns that grow in the uh, rocks. These are cyanotis, uh, cyanotis flowering here. And this is one of the rocky islands where uh, we are growing the uh, plants native to the Aravlis. This is a granite granite habitat. You also get granite in the Aravlis and this is, it has its own um, plant community. And this is what it is showcasing. And you can see lots of signs, interpretation. This is a display of uh, display of sandstones of Rajasthan, which we are calling as Manhattan, Manhattan, but Manhattan. And you can see the ripples on the rocks. That's what uh, tells you the story of sandstone, why there are ripples. The ripples tell a uh, whole story of uh, the landscape of Rajasthan. So we have woven that in the full interpretation. So this is a water body we have. You can, you can see this has become a, a semi-perennial water body and the largest landscape has become a shrubland. So that's it. I think it will be nice to have a discussion uh, on these things. Yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Vijay, um, and we welcome a lot of questions. We already have several from the chat. Um, very impressive work, and you know we'd love to um, see your faces if you'd like to turn on your video. If not, that's perfectly okay. But let me um, start off with a couple of questions, and please continue to share on the chat. We will be monitoring it. So uh, one question, Vijay, is, is the research community working with you to assess the impact of your actions in water recharge, biodiversity, carbon sequestration? Yes, we have, uh, we have JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University, professor who has designed a study which looks into the carbon sequestering, which looks into <clears throat> um, uh, the species diversity as well. So yes, but what we are doing is we are getting citizen to get involved in it. And uh, many of the Anvil Gaon team members are actively involved in this research. And uh, um, so we have collected three years data now of 12 permanent plots, one hectare each. That's what we are, that's what we have done. <clears throat> in, in, terms of, in terms of birds, we have uh, this eBird Cornell University uh, citizen science uh, portal where people go and collect data on the birds. That uh, that's very very uh, important for us because it tells you 
again, this is citizen science, and that tells you the diversity of birds that has that we are reporting in the park. Um, then we have, in terms of frogs, amphibians, we have uh, Dr. Robin Suez, who every year conducts surveys on amphibians and uh, reports on their state. So we, we see in, in the Arabi Biodiversity Park, we have closed our first phase. Now we are moving into another phase. Another phase is to study biodiversity, and is to look at more human interactions, programs into the park and all of that. So we, we are transitioning um, you know, from, from restoration work to uh, more, more uh, programs and interactive work. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question about your, um, I know that Priti mentioned it in the in the chat and for everyone, Priti Sanwalka works with Vijay in Ayam Gurgaon and uh, she did uh, uh, answer it as well, but they, someone, uh, Kathy Wolf, Dr. Kathy Wolf wants to know, Vijay, um, what is your background and what are the backgrounds of the um, team? Uh, so uh, I, I don't have a background in, in ecology or botany. I have picked up from, from my 23, 24 years of being in forests, learning from the forest and people who, uh, so basically wandering into the forest, what I have picked up. And then of course, working with Pradeep Krishan, who is again, not a, not a restorer uh, in, the, in, the, in the technical way, but he has, uh, we have worked together in several projects before this project. And um, I think, um, um, yeah, so technically most of our team are generalists. We are generalists. Um, and I actually, I lead a course called Barefoot Botanist, which is about understanding plants from a lay person's uh, point of view and the ecology in from lay person's point of view. So we, most of us in the team are uh, non-scientists, so to say, non-researchers. Perfect. Let's I go. I will yes, this please. Balaji. This is Balaji, Hi, Balaji, and there is one question about uh, uh, what kind of institutions, government agencies uh, do you partner and uh, who have the ownership of this uh, degraded land? How does this whole partnership work and how do you work with them? Do you partner it's, them? It, yeah, it's very interesting because every, every project that we have worked has been on a different relationship, like the Sarafli Biodiversity Park, was purely voluntary. Ayan Gurgaon came into it from a very philanthropic in terms of, you know, that we will we are doing service. We are voluntary putting our efforts into whatever government wants to do. We'll help them with design. We'll help them with, uh, you know, wherever they need help. To transitioning to getting an MOU with the government and saying that, okay, for eight years, we will restore this place. Yeah, and uh, then similarly, now we are quite savvy. We, we straight away go into MOUs. We say, okay, we want an MOU with you. We want to understand uh, this is what we can deliver. This is what, uh, if you like, this is what we can give you. And uh, we work on those uh, projects. Um, most of our funding is from corporates. It's from uh, corporate social responsibility. A very small, tiny amount comes from comes from uh, individual donation. Um, people also donate individually quite a uh, quite a bit, which is a substantial number in terms of numbers. But in terms of uh, money coming into the kitty is less. But it's endearing to see people voluntarily giving their money for restoration. Yeah. So in terms of relationship, uh, mostly MOUs is what we are going into. And it's a collaboration between the agency, like Arabli Biodiversity Park is with municipality, uh, municipality. the Chakarpur Wazirabad is with the forest department, the Sikandarpur watershed restoration is with the, is with the GMDA, another developing agency of the government. The, so that's, that's the model, Balaji. I hope I've answered you. Great, thank you. Uh, so just to clarify, just to clarify, you 
so depending on the jurisdiction you do partner with different types of government agencies so yeah. and most of these what will be the what what is the role of the government uh, you know whether it is municipality or whether it is uh, uh, the forest or whether it is uh, urban disaster management authorities what kind of role do they play apart from giving you the responsibilities of and asking you to do one two three four do they play any role yes in 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 different projects again it is different like in the aravli biodiversity park all the civil works were done by the municipal corporation all the fencing work fencing of the land was done by the uh, municipal corporation the security provided is by municipal corporation yeah so and if there is a fire or if there is the encroachment it is the municipality that looks into it we we help them we kind of raise alarm we tell them that we need to do this but they execute it whereas in chakarpur wazirabad band it is not like that everything is done by is done by uh, ayam gurgaon except for the removal of encroachments where there is con conflict or dispute it is managed by the uh, governing agency yeah so that's uh, the model in the jaipur project which i am not doing with angur ga there everything is done by the government we are so to say designers and consultants and executing team yeah thank you great thank you uh, alison i think we have some other questions in the chat yeah we have a question from armando wondering if the research community is working with you to assess the impact of your actions on water recharge, biodiversity, or carbon sequestration? I yes, believe... we have a, we have answered this question. Yeah. Oh, oops. We have study, we have already a study put up in the Ravi Biodiversity Park, not in all the areas, but only in Ravi Biodiversity Park. We don't have for Sikandarpur, we don't have for uh, Chakarpur, we don't have for Bachapur, but for Ravi Biodiversity Park, we have already made 12 one hectare plots. Um, plus, we have uh, uh, different biodiversity surveys that happen periodically. Great. Um, let's see, I have a question here. Have you enforced a minimum for planting native species as to restore the native biodiversity? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Have you enforced a minimum for planting native species in order to restore the native biodiversity? Uh, yes. I mean, uh, when we say that we are imitating a forest, we are bringing a forest. It is forest, true forest. It's not the forest that has been recorded as native forest. The species I've been talking about, such as Boswellia serrata forest or Anomysis pendula forest, these are native forests. You can't do it without native plants. So our our mission has been to promote native plants in the larger city landscape. In um, we our nursery has been providing plants to many projects. We have started our sale for of native plants to many people. <clears throat> And um, so, yeah, we have, we have been advocating native plants since last 20 years. And um, Vijay, just a little aside, can you talk a little bit about how you, um, this is the most fascinating part for me at least, uh, comb through all these uh, extensive historical records to look for these plants? Well, yeah, very easy. I mean, I, I wish I could have shown you the, 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 books here we have flora of the region uh, dated i mean uh, this is one of the assets of colonialism which uh, which is documentation of flora so we have flora documented right from uh, you know uh, 18th century onwards you know late 18th century onwards from malabar to um, the oldest flora that i refer in the ravlis is from uh, 1915, which is by R. N. Parker, uh, Dr. R. N. Parker, who has made several, several trips in the Ravlis, and he, uh, in his uh, journals and his 
in his flora he mentioned what kind of forests what kind of communities what so there's lots of uh, information there and uh, we look at flora we look at old flora we also look at new flora as to people who are studying new flora what are they telling you you know so every year we also keep on adding new species which we find that has not been reported like uh, i'll give you an example like ephedra uh, there is something called Eph Ephedra uh, Felicata, which is which is not reported, but we I have seen myself, so I got it, and we planted in the park. Similarly, we saw uh, another species called Kirki or Sericostoma. Again, we brought in because uh, we saw it, and it's not reported in the flora. Yeah, another species, Hymnodictyon, which is a large tree, which is uh, not reported again. But we saw one whole valley of this tree, so we brought it back into the Aravli. In fact, we are making it, we are providing it to the people also through our nursery. You know, it's a handsome tree that we are providing to people, you know, through our sales. So, yeah, so we refer to the flora mainly. And um, I think over many, many years, I have got used to using flora and botanical uh, lang language. And therefore, it becomes easy to understand. Thank you. Sure. Maybe Jeff, we have uh, one more question, which is uh, which is asking you in terms of uh, uh, assisted natural generation has been more effective. I think what we have done here, uh, Jaipur, and mm -hmm. why did you decide to do so? I mean. Uh, uh, is it as a strategy, or uh, is it just that you wanted to attempt one more one more way of doing things? So, so yeah, your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's very easy actually. The land tells you, the edific condition tells you what grows best. So mm -hmm. you look at the climax climax forest that exists in that edific condition. If it is uh, Aravli rocks, what are the uh, climax forests that you get? And you imitate that and you bring back that. In terms of uh, sand dunes, in terms of these piling up fossil dunes, the climax is of a shrubland. And shrublands have grasses, forbs, and many, and few trees. Um, so that's what you do. But in terms of uh, method of assisted uh, natural regeneration, I think um, sand lends itself much easy because it's, you know, firstly the diversity uh, is huge, but most of it is ephemeral, uh, so it becomes easy. But uh, in terms of mined land, it is very difficult because there is nothing left in the soil. There is nothing left, not even seeds, because you have already mined the top layer, you know. So in, uh, of course, it's not a very very severely mined land. Otherwise, it will be very very difficult. But um, <clears throat> largely what you saw was the invasion of uh, 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 exotic uh, 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 pioneers, uh, invasive species such as Prosopis juliflora or Partheniums or, you know, many others. So um, it is a good combination of uh, uh, what, how to be efficient. I think landscape tells you how to be efficient. If you look at the landscape, look at the climax landscape, and uh, it becomes easy to imitate that. All right, this is my question to you, Vijay. Uh, <laughs> you know, in your project, I always felt packs more than one message. You know, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, how do you do restoration of degraded land? How do you ensure uh, you know the uh, native species to flourish versus the invasive species and how do you uh, you know in terms of uh, get the volunteerism and public partnerships but there are just too many messages you know and uh, all good things many good things in one uh, and you know either sing either singularly or collectively all these messages are so important to so many parts of india so what is happening in terms of, what are you doing in terms of taking these messages to different states? And are there any places uh, in different states which have, uh, which have learned from your experiment and uh, you know, trying to replicate this or seeking your help to replicate this? 
sorry for a long question but uh, it's always been burning so let, let me first thank you for ex i will extract the compliments first and say thank you for, for saying all that um, um you see firstly look at the footprint that we have we have urban footprint we don't have so much rural footprint um rural restoration is a big challenge and uh, i dabbled into the whole area of restoration from rural side where any movement was such a big you know it, it would take years to show some improvement whereas in urban spaces which are seats of power seats of money seats of attention aware citizen you know uh, resourceful money is coming from somewhere else you know the whole mechanism of a, of a urban setup is very different so in our urban footprint we uh, what we learned and we are still learning you know it's not that we have mastered anything with every project we learn more and we are learning that you know there is we have to integrate people we have to get money from corporates uh, for it to be more accountable for more, it to be more easy for for corporates to understand that they uh, they they are part of larger uh, you know messaging uh, yes it has uh, many many other organization uh, i'm sure before us also must have been doing similar work but are also doing similar work now and um, unfortunately it, rest, it is restricted to urban settings because um, uh, livelihoods uh, restoration in rural area which are where it is needed a lot as well because uh, and i know incredible organizations large organizations who work in large landscapes you know uh, across 20 districts that kind of a you know it is tough it is really tough to convince people where there are uh, cattle which you know your livelihood it depends on the cattle and then you have to protect you ask them to protect the jungle how do they protect the jungle they need to graze their cattle so then you come up with a management plan because stakeholders are very different and it's not that i can fence off and i say boss you are not coming in here anymore you know it is it is their land it is their uh, uh, traditional rights so working on those are huge challenges and um, in in uh, for you uh, to answer your question it is um, yeah we have seen many many organizations who are working on similar similar messaging similar in Delhi, in Delhi, we have seen many. Swecha is there. This uh, People Baba is doing similar work, or you know, uh, in terms of getting CSR money, get people, getting people involved, and all of those. Uh, Vimlandu and his team is doing all of that, and many others. You know, uh, uh, it is a. I think this is the future. We have to get everybody involved. That's the future. Thank you. Thanks, Vijay. Our next question is about volunteer engagement. Um, so we're yes, wondering please. what the motivation is for volunteers um, and how more volunteers can join. As, as we speak today, we had uh, not many, but uh, four. But there were days when we had 17 volunteers working in the nursery. And uh, this is not like a nursery in um, in uh, in any developed country such as UK or US. These are really bare bone nurseries. So uh, you don't, uh, so people are volunteering and they love to come. They love to be part of a revival process. See, that's the good thing about Gurugaon. Firstly, it's a young generation. Secondly, they are educated. Third, they see challenges in the city, as I pointed it out, that water is depleting, air is polluted, there are campaigns happening to protect the forests. So, <clears throat> so they come forward for any, they need release. They need to, they, the inner urge uh, is coming out. You know, it's like yin yang, where you have pushed it so much that the other element is coming out that we want to come and make a difference. That's what is happening, you know. Uh, it's very easy for us to give a call and there are hundreds of volunteers who come up and say that, okay, you tell us what to do and we do it, you know. But it's not that first year onwards it happened, but it slowly grew credibility over the organization. They saw for themselves that things change. They have made a difference. 
uh, in the whole endeavor and therefore um, yeah so it is an uh, we have been lucky with the programs. We have been lucky with uh, even I am Gurgaon. You know, the, the organization to become very stiff is very easy. But for them also to become uh, lucid and learning and do we don't know what to do. Let's do it. Let's try. Let's do this. You know, all that uh, matters. And as a result, we have involved people in citizen science. We have involved people in uh, nursery activity and planting activity. So the yeah, so hope I've answered this. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Thank our next question um, is if you have a sense of how the general public is reacting to and accessing um, the sites that you've helped restore. Have you discovered any change in perceptions about the landscapes? Yes, I mean, I'm talking about Aravli Biodiversity Park because it has been the longest project we have been involved with, uh, eight, nine, ten years now. So it is very curious case because initially people would give you suggestions. They would tell you, plant this. Why are you not planting this? You should be planting this, you know, create, uh, plant fruit trees. Then you would ask them fruit for whom? Humans or animals or birds for whom? And, and every tree fruits, most of the trees fruits, you know. Uh, large part of uh, trees uh, fruit so what what is it that you so it is a um, yeah from there to grass cutting people would come in their big suvs and bring four people to cut the grass to today appreciating walking in the park is a huge journey i i often use this phrase that people who used to bring their cattle are now bringing their exotic dogs for walk you know, as they have made money over this last 10 years, you have seen that people who are cutting grass are now bringing these large, you know, exotic breeds of dogs to walk, walk them in the park. So that that is one transition. I mean, sorry for for my statement, but um, there is a change. There is a perception change. Uh, people, uh, the jungle has showed it. You know, till 2015, it was so difficult to convince people that what we are doing is going to yield result. Wait, wait, wait. I remember a forester coming in and telling, you know, you have just planted along the roadside. You have not planted anything inside. So uh, when we had to, then we had to take it him inside and show him, you know, this little thing, that's, that's what we have planted. After three years, this is only little because the Neil guy is eating it up, you know. So, but now after 2015, suddenly there was, while our plants, most of the energy they put in initial years is in their root zone. They try to make ways into the moisture, nutrients, and after some time, like four or five years, they give a push to the uh, shoots, you know, and that's when they, the jungle started showing up. It was a great learning for me and for everybody in I am Guriga, you know the jungle transform it's in a role it's in its own role <laughs> we have nothing to do with it yeah thank you um Vijay, i have a question about uh youth engagement and um i guess the first question is um how do you get young people um to and do you work with schools to get them into the park and into restoration efforts aside from tree planting what else do you do to engage young people so uh, you mean uh, what age group when you say young yes uh, i'm talking about grade schools primary schools, school. okay so uh, as i said you know we are in transition we have been restoring and not so much reaching out but uh, i think our next phase is to reach out we created um, me and few of our colleagues, we created modules for different classes. We, as I said, we have 12 permanent plots. Within those 12 permanent plots, we have made different plots, small, small plots. So we said, okay, each class can come and make observations, you know, whether it is monthly, whether it is, you know, uh, weekly, however you want, make observations and we can talk about uh, learning through that. But you know, all these programs need so much energy, you know, you need to have 
you have to you need to have human resource and uh, right now um, we as I said we, that's the next step that's what we are going to do and so meanwhile we uh, in very little effort we are putting into it but we should be putting more effort in that direction thank you BJ Balaji, did you have a question? Um, I think you had a question. Yes. Vijay, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I have two questions. Actually, you can take on one by one or one hour, one whenever you have time. My first question is about all these urban forest initiatives. You know, hmm. in what way can you connect them to resilient infrastructure? Which is, I mean, how... Do they act? Do they add to the resilience of infrastructure around them? Uh, that's one. And the second question I had was about uh, the COVID-19 context. You know, are you seeing any decreased people, volunteers coming to work, and the visitors, less visitors? Has it helped you in, uh, uh, you know, doing some quick work, or has it hampered your work? The COVID-19. So these are two. How did yeah, they? Yeah. Yeah. add to the urban resilience and the COVID. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I really don't understand urban resilience, but if you mm -hmm. mean ecological resilience in terms of, um, um, you know, how does this land contribute to the overall health of the city? Is that your question? Mm -hmm. I really didn't understand your first question. Yes, that is what I meant. Okay. So, yeah, uh, definitely. Built infrastructure, social infrastructure, whatever way, you know, how did it uh, make it more resilient? So, so in terms of <clears throat> resilience of a, of a forest uh, in relation to an urban context is, um, I think uh, it may have many layers from well-being, uh, human well-being, uh, the sense of connection uh, that there is wild and you so there is a whole element of human um, human well-being that uh, that's I think contributes to uh, to the resilience of the whole uh, place it is working as groundwater recharge uh, big reservoir and therefore very very important it is working as the whole idea of propagating native plants so this is this becomes hope you know for for all the interventions that happen at least in haryana and uh, and in the catchment of other states where people are inspired to take it on uh, in terms of carbon dioxide uh, sink it is it plays a huge role uh, in in terms of providing oxygen it is a huge role because it play it's such a big area with such high bi biodiversity plant biodiversity it is providing uh, rich carbon uh, to uh, rich oxygen to to the cities which are <clears throat> uh, that's happening that's already being studied by seri um, so um, yeah i don't know if if i've answered your first question Yes, Balaji. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And and now I forgot your second question. What was it? Uh, COVID nineteen. You know, is it? Yes. So co co yeah, co COVID nineteen was um, was a shock for everybody. I think uh, it's very unfortunate that we all that there is you know everything has shattered from so many deaths to disease to you know, breaking off, down of economies, all of that. Now, even I was not able to go for to the park for two months because I was I, I live far off from the park, you know, so the boundaries are closed and I can't visit the park. And there was yearning to go to the park, you know, and uh, uh, the few who could go to the park, my supervisors or or the labor or the gardeners i would call them up and what is happening what is flowering what is not flowering what is fruiting what interactions you're seeing and all of that and they would send me pictures of that and when a few times i got a pass to go to the park i used to feel every person who loves nature should be here should be you know there is so much release there is so much pent up frustration hopelessness and a place nature gives you so much hope 
And when I saw those flowerings, I clicked pictures, I made posts for people to see that so much is flowering. And I wished that people could come and see it, you know, for themselves. And that's, um, um, yeah, so it gave us opportunity to do certain things. But um, I think this park is in a state where we want people year round to come and experience it, you know, experience its beauty. And uh, when we opened it, I, I must tell you, people were celebrating that they could have a release, you know. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Our next question um, is whether there has been any evidence of an increase in demand from residents who live near or to live near the park. Um, or has there been an increase in business activity in the surrounding area, such as food vendors? Uh, outside the park, yes. Outside the park, yes. Early morning, you see uh, people who <clears throat> make fresh juices of wheat, wheat um, uh, sprouts to you know various other <clears throat> pro-health drinks. Uh, so they come in their car, you know, fix their uh, engine to to their machines and make quick drinks for people to have there are food stalls there are you know uh, what, things that you know all that hawking happens in that zone <clears throat> uh, in terms of real estate it's also strange because when i hear the count of people because there were this was a stone crushing zone so imagine a stone crusher you know there is so much dust there there's so much pollu dust pollution and noise pollution. And people who live in the vicinity of, the, you know, very close to the park, the land prices were the lowest. Now, slowly you see a surge in land prices of that area because you are close to a big piece of restored land. Now, of course, they complain, some of them complain that we get snakes in our land and we get, you know, wildlife in the land. But other than that, I think um, there, is, uh, there is this happening, yeah the there is a appreciation of of uh, land that's great thank you thank you i don't see any more questions in the chat um i have one more uh, well i have a question sorry please hello yes welcome abhimanyu Hi. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, hi. Uh, hi, Vijay. Uh, hope you are doing well. Uh, well, uh, right now I'm based in uh, Andhra uh, at the Andhra Karnataka border. So my question is: so at the vicinity of the parks, like, uh, has uh, has the uh, biodiversity park solved the water crisis in the neighbor uh, neighbor residents, like neighboring residents? Uh, sorry, come again, please. I missed your question. Uh, my question is, so the people who are residing near, nearby to the biodiversity park, has mm. the restoration of the landscape solved any of their water crisis? I don't know if I can say that. Firstly, mm -hmm. water comes from far. It does not come from this land. The okay. water is a piped connection. And... Uh, in fact, we are using them. We are using their waste and their waste water. And, uh, you know, uh, we have a small STP in the park mm -hmm. where we treat their water and use it in our nursery and wherever our new planting is. So, so it's the other way around. Uh, in terms of uh, city and cities, uh, you know, water demand, um, um, most of the water in the, like there is no provision for bore well in Gurgaon now, you cannot dig a bore well or you cannot deepen your bore well. So there is no way that people who are living in the vicinity can extract the water, even if the water table is going high. <clears throat> water comes through the pipelines, which is either coming from Yamuna or is being, uh, uh, or from bore wells, which government operates. So I hope I have answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Abhimanyu. Hey, Vijay, I have one last question for you. OK, thank you, Balaji. It's about the road which is going through, right? I mean, uh, uh, has it 
I mean, is it a challenge to have that robot or uh, uh, is it creating any problem or uh, it is right next to the park? I mean, because of noise and whatever. See, or, uh, you you mean the MG road, right? Yeah, was it allowed to call the road or? Uh, so the MG road, which is Merali Gurgaon road is not a new road. It is a very old road. It is as old as I think uh, the last Delhi was before independence, you know, before the Britishers took over. It was <clears throat> when the old Delhi was very, very active. That's this Mehrauli Gurgaon road was active then also. So, <clears throat> so it is an old road, which they have expanded and made it into, into a big road. Of course, it's a challenge, but it is something that was given to us, you know, it was not something came up later. So uh, you, you worked on those limitations. It is, of course, blocking the corridor, wildlife corridor. That is possible if this road was not there. If this road was not there, we would be, we, and if there are two more roads, which if they were not there, we would be connected to that tiger reserve that I was talking about. We would be connected. So there, there was hope for tigers to walk all the way here. <laughs> Or at least leopards, <laughs> but uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's a busy road, and there is no way. I mean, we can <clears throat> unless we make underground tunnels, hoping that wildlife uses it, or some of the wildlife uses it. There is no way we can uh, hope other than birds move coming from the other regions. Thank you, Vijay. Liza, thank you, Balaji. Have... Yes, thank you, Vijay. And I just want to invite anybody else who um, has any question for Vijay and uh, maybe some lingering questions from before. Um, Demoy, are you still on the line? Just I know you had a question about um, a technical question about reforestation. I'm not sure if you still wanted to ask Vijay that question. Demoy from Jamaica. Yes, I'm still online, um, Liza. Hi, I, welcome to my... Morning. Morning. Um, I'm in the Cayman Islands, and we have a very um, flat um, topography. Um, it's very dry with, um, with, with high water table, but we want to embark on a national tree planting project, especially in the Georgetown area is our capital. Um, what we, I like the idea, which, which I think I've gotten some answers to my question by listening, which um, you seem to have used a lot of natives. So I don't really have a question, but I want to thank you for clarity and some of the thoughts I, you know, that was bothering me in my head. So I think leaving this presentation to them much clearer. Thank you, Demoy. Yes. It's a pleasure to hear and all the best wishes to do what you're doing. I'm sure you will do a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. So if nobody has any questions, we can perhaps close. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much, Vijay, for a wonderful presentation. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining us. Um, one final announcement before we close. Um, this Friday, we will have two former alumni of the Urban Forestry and Community Engagement Seminar, um, Tina Jeskalski and Abdallah Tafik. Um, they'll be discussing their experiences with the lockdown, um, how the pandemic has affected them and brought issues such as environmental justice, um, challenges faced by women and youth, social incohesion and mental health. Um, that presentation will be this Friday, July 17th at 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, we'll be sending out an invitation to that um, in the next few days. So thank you everyone again for joining us um, and we hope to see you Friday. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Neza and Allison and Balaji and everybody.